You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. This is 21st Century Radio, and I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Now, we are going to return to one of my earlier interviews with my old friend, Sir George Martin. George Martin was producer of almost all the Beatles records, as well as many of their solo efforts afterwards. In recognition of his services to the music industry and pop culture, he was made a Knight of the British Empire in 1996. In 1943, at the age of 17, George Martin joined the Fleet Air Arm and became a pilot and commissioned officer. The war ended before he was involved in any combat, and he left the service in 1947. He first worked for the BBC's Classical Music Department, then joined EMI in 1950, spending his first years with the Parlophone record label recording classical and Baroque music, original cast recordings of hit plays, and regional music from around the British Isles. He also produced numerous comedy and novelty records, working with the offbeat acts like Peter Sellers and the Goons. He first auditioned the Beatles in 1962, after they had been turned down by most of the major British labels, although his initial reaction was that they were pretty awful. Martin signed them to a recording contract marking the beginning of a long relationship in which Martin's musical expertise helped fill the gap between the Beatles' raw talent and the sound they wanted to achieve. Most of the orchestral arrangements and instrumentation, as well as frequent keyboard parts on the early records, on Beatles records, were made or performed by Martin in collaboration with the band. As I mentioned last hour, Sir George Martin has granted 21st Century Radio five exclusive interviews over the years. Interviews with Martin are so rare, in fact, that in 1995, even ABC News Radio had to contract with Hieronymus and Company for a clip of him speaking about Free as a Bird, the first new Beatles song in 25 years. In 1997, Sir George joined Zahara Hieronymus on The Zo Show, live from the Hard Rock Cafe remote broadcast auction to raise funds for the hurricane-stricken island of Montserrat, Martin's second home. Sir George Martin wrote the introduction to my 2002 book called Inside the Yellow Submarine, The Making of the Beatles Animated Classic. Through our many visits and conversations with both Sir George and Lady Judy Martin, we have discovered many mutual passions, which we will cover tonight, along with our review of his most recent book, The Summer of Love by Genesis Publications. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio, Sir George Martin, and thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, yeah, good, good to be with you. This is going to be really great. Okay. How did working with the comedy act of the Goons turn out to be an advantage when you eventually met the Beatles? Um, well, the Goons, well, they were extraordinary people. Uh-huh. And uh, Peter Sellers in particular was a great mimic, and the whole point about making records with them was that you had to create a kind of situation, a, a scene in sound. And um, so that if I was had an idea for Peter to maybe walk across the park with someone and be chatting to them, you'd have to put in all the necessary sounds, the sound effects and so on. And it was a good learning curve to work like that and, and create pictures in sound, which um, came in, in very useful later. When you first met the Beatles, you didn't like their music. You liked their wacky sense of humor and general attitude to life. Why did your comedy work attract them to you? I guess the Beatles and I had the same kind of humor. You know, they were they were great goon fans anyway, and, and they knew all the records I'd been making with Spike Milliken and Peter Sellers. <laughs> so they, to them, I was, uh, I was something that they were admired before I even met up. And... Um, they just had this offbeat way of looking at things, and they were they were extraordinary people in those early days because they they really believed that they were going to be successful, even though they weren't. I mean, they 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 weren't at all um, musically uh, attractive. The, the stuff they gave us wasn't very good, but they were determined to make it so. Friends, I want to play you a few clips from the British comedy troupe called The Goons so you can compare them to The Beatles and hear for yourself how similar The Beatles' sense of humor was to these George Martin-produced comedy records that The Beatles heard on BBC while growing up. First, we'll hear 30 seconds of a skit from The Goons followed by 30 seconds from a Beatles Christmas record 
they made for their fan club. I think so. <laughs> now, why is this buddy lying down? He's been murdered. Badly? No, very well. He's dead. <laughs> Let's have a look at him. What? A fake bullet hole? What does this mean? He was murdered by a fake bullet. <laughs> God, what a hellish way to die. Did you see his assailant? No, he had his coat buttoned up. <laughs> but the murderer was a fuel man with a ling hat and farglow boots. And yes? he went that away. After him, after him, after him, after him! And seeing as we gather around the Christmas microphone here in the studio, we might as well get together with a little Christmas message for you. Which goes something like, like this. this. Christmas comes but once a year, but when it does, you know it's here because we've got some. See. Hello, this is John speaking with his voice. We're all very happy to be able to talk to you like this on this little bit of plastic. And if that's not enough, here are 30 more seconds of the goons in which they use one of their catchphrases, It's All in the Mind, followed by 30 seconds from the Beatles' Yellow Submarine in which they also used It's All in the Mind as a catchphrase. Where's my shovel? You can't bury me! I want to join the guards! No man under six feet can join the guards. Let us not worry. It's all in the mind, you know. It says here in small print. Hey, well, well that's my car, Lark. How would you know it's your car, Lark? No, it's anywhere. What's it look like, then? Well, it's red with yellow wheels. I mean, blue with orange wheels, huh? It's all in the mind. The British certainly do have a wacky sense of humor, as Sir George just said. Now let's get back to Sir George Martin and his work as producer on one of the most influential rock and roll albums of all time, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and why it had such a huge impact on the world of music. You wrote that Sgt. Pepper drove a splitting wedge through the heart of British pop. What did you mean by that? Well, Sgt. Pepper driving a wedge through the heart of British pop. I guess the whole thing about Pepper was that it was something that people hadn't hadn't heard before and it hadn't occurred to people that you could make a record like this. And um, it was new. I mean, we'd been brought up on a diet of two-and-a-half-minute pop songs, which had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and uh, there was nothing particularly startling about that. But the Beatles started becoming much more... Um, daring and adventurous when they um, in things like Tomorrow Never Knows for example which was on the Revolver record and they were ready for something really new Mm -hmm. I want to quote you again from page 28 you say the power to move people to tears or laughter or to violence or sympathy is the strongest attribute that any art can have in this respect, music is the prime mover. Its call on the emotions is the most direct of all the arts. Could you please elaborate on this theme? I think music is is in, amazing, really. I mean, no one can really define what it is. It's obviously sounds, but what makes one sound more pleasant than another? There's a tremendous mystery about music. And um, what makes a minor chord sad? What makes a major chord happy? All these kind of things people don't really go in and think about but the the whole thing is that it is such an emotional uh, art it it really gets down into your very soul and no amount of descriptions or analysis can actually ever get to the root of music Uh you know you can look at music in a score but it doesn't come alive until you hear musicians playing it and then it can move the soul and in that respect, it's it's far more appealing, I think, than any visual art or dance or whatever. Other people might quarrel with me on that, but I believe I think the music is the prime mover. What did you mean when you said the song Strawberry Fields set the agenda for the whole album? Strawberry Fields was the first track that we did for the new album, and it was in November 1966 that we started doing this. 
And uh, it, for the first time, I had the Beatles in the studio for as long as we liked. Mm -hmm. Up to that time, I'd been given the odd day or evening because uh, they were so frantically busy with all the work they did all over the world in, in concerts and televisions and all sorts of shows. And um, they got fed up with it and they got a bit scared too because they started getting death threats and they had a very uncomfortable time in the Philippines and and um, they they decided they wouldn't do it, do any more of it and they just they wanted to concentrate on recording in the studio with me. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point. And the first song that John brought along for me was Strawberry Fields. Uh, and he, the first time I heard it, he stood in front of me with his acoustic guitar. I sat in a high stool, and he started playing it, and it shook me. I mean, I, it re I, I was completely in love with what I heard, and I thought it was fantastic to have my own personal performance from John Lennon for the first time on this song, Strawberry Fields. And I knew we were in for a most creative time with that, and... Uh, it was true, and because Paul responded to Strawberry Fields with his own song that was evocative of his, his youth, and that was Penny Lane. Uh-huh. And that did set the agenda for the album. Neither of those songs, of course, were on the album. Why was that? There was a strange thing about records in those days that one in England, at any rate, you didn't put on to an album a hit single, or any single, in fact. You kept them separate. We like to give value for money, and in fact, Brian and I determined that we, because the songs were short, generally speaking, we would try and get 14 songs onto an album. And if we made a separate single, then we wouldn't include it in the album. Aha! Uh -huh. I mean, it's crazy nowadays, because singles drive the albums, and if you don't get an, an album with a single on it, you're, you're lost. But we thought we better keep Strawberry Fields and... and and Penny Lane as a separate entity. In in fact, it became the first record not to make number one, uh, which was rather a disappointment for us. And when you think about it, it was such an amazing combination of, of of titles. But that was the first one in in a row of about ten or eleven that did, wasn't number one. But of course, it did set the scene for the album that was to follow, of which it should really have been a part. Well, I was very interested to learn about how you decided to leave EMI to form your own independent recording studio, eventually called AIR for Associated Independent Recording, with whom you have since been enormously successful, recording acts like Phil Collins, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and many others. Could you tell us about some of the disagreements you had with EMI and when and why you decided to set up AIR, and was that in 1965? Actually, I tried to renegotiate my contract with EMI long before 65. Okay. Um, and I ended up signing uh, for a three-year deal in 1962, basically because I needed the money. Um, and uh, I got very little. I got £3,000 a year and no perks, no car or anything like that. Um, minimal expenses. And... Uh, £3,000 a year wasn't bad money, but it wasn't good either. And there was I fought constantly for having a royalty of some sort, some commission on sales, which, in fact, all the reps and the salesmen got from the records I was making. So that at Christmas time, when records were selling like mad, I got nothing, and all the salesmen were loading their pockets with money. I was really, really uh, angry about that. Mm-hmm. So I decided, after a long time, to leave EMI. I thought, well, I can do better by myself than this. You know, I'm sure I could. By the time 65 came along, at the end of my three-year three contract, I refused to resign, and I, I thought, well, I'll set up my own company. And I should have gone out by myself, but I didn't. I, I was too cautious, and I took along with me three guys who were junior to me, but I thought, well, they're younger and they will make my company stronger. Well, they did to begin with, because Peter Sullivan was recording Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones 
and John Burgess was recording Manfred Mann and Adam Faith and so on. And Ron Richards was recording The Hollies and many other people. So AIR became a partnership with four people. This is 21st Century Radio, and we're listening to an interview I did with Beatles producer Sir George Martin. Coming up in the next segment, he's going to compare the Beatles' new album Love for the Cirque du Soleil with his musical collage from the Abbey Road album. Well, I appreciate your courtesy and patience. You've been <coughs> always been a most polite and, um, as I say, patient man. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank you, Bob. We're listening to one of the numerous exclusive interviews granted to 21st Century Radio by the so-called best producer of all time, Sir George Martin. In this segment, we asked Sir George about the Las Vegas Beatles musical extravaganza called Love, performed by Cirque du Soleil. The soundtrack is an entirely new mashup of Beatles samples created by Sir George, together with his son Giles Martin, like the one we just heard that combined Get Back, Glass Onion, and Hello Goodbye. If you are anywhere in the general vicinity of Las Vegas in the next few years, I strongly urge you to make plans to stop for the night and see this one-of-a-kind and thoroughly mind-blowing experience. So, George, tell us about the Las Vegas show Love. Love, yeah, Love by Cirque du Soleil is a combination with them and Beatles, which I was amazed that ever happened because the Beatle company have been notoriously difficult to accommodate. But by persistent negotiation, they got together to do this show and they brought me in on it because um, they wanted a one and a half hour soundtrack. Well, the brief they gave me was really an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, they, they said, we want one and a half hours of music and you can take it. Anything you want from what you've recorded with the Beatles, mm -hmm. any sound, any track, any whatever, and make it into a one and a half hour collage, in fact, rather like you did at the end of Abbey Road, but much longer. And I knew that this was going to be quite a challenge. I knew I couldn't do it by myself. I know, you know, I'm an old man now, and I was an old man even when I started the Cirque du Soleil. And my hearing has been going down the pan. And um, I, I also, I'm not really au fait with modern technology. I can cope with a lot of it, but not in the way that my son could. So I brought him in on it. And uh, it was the best cooperation I think I've ever had in my life, working with him. Um, we got on like a house on fire. And his input was amazing. He, was, he had all the... Um, all the creativity and the, the inspiration that I had when I was in my 30s and 40s. And he brought it to bear on this stuff that we were listening to. So we, we were amazed, actually, when we went through the Beatle catalogue that most of it hadn't been put onto hard disk. It was still in original tape form. And that was one of the first things that Charles did, put it onto hard disk and catalogued it at the same time. And the result was, well, you know what the result was. It, um, it became the Beatles' love album. But more importantly, it was the background to a, a fantastic show in Las Vegas. And um, enormously enjoyable and very, very satisfying that it became probably the most successful show that Cirque du Soleil have ever had. It's still running to packed houses in Las Vegas after nearly a year. And I think it'll run for many years. Well, on page 85, you wrote, I enjoyed experimenting, building sound pictures, creating a whole atmosphere for a song, all the things I'd always loved doing anyway. It made me realize that the fences we put up between art and music could not be broken down, that crossover might sometimes be possible. How was this something you tried to do on Pepper? Those fences we put up between art and music, well... Uh, you know, I, I've I've always had a pretty Catholic taste in my music. I, I like pretty well everything. I love jazz and I like classical music, and I like rock and roll if it's good. Um, and when we were making Pepper, then we were actually combining classical and rock and roll, and a little bit of jazz, but not much. Um, and the result was a very good and successful record. And I tried to. Uh, inspire the guys, particularly John and Paul, into thinking more along those terms of wedding different art forms together. 
And I actually said, said to Paul and John, do you know what sonata form is? And of course they didn't. I said, well, it's, it's the way that classical music and symphonies are written. And, you know, you could take a leaf out of that and, and think of a lot more continuous work where you, you bring back a particular subject that you've had before and maybe a different key or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, make up uh, a complete, uh, like a mini symphony of rock and roll music. Well, Paul was intrigued by this, but um, John said, George, I'm a, I'm a rocker. I can't think of that, you know. I like my songs short and sweet, and, and I can't do that. But so when we were doing Abbey Road, um, Paul and I worked out the long bit, and John actually, t to give him credit, he, he when he heard what we were doing, he came over and he said, well, I might be able to help you here. There's a song you might put in here, and he played me maybe, I don't know, coming through the bathroom window or, or one of those. And he was actually helped us to put in bits and pieces in our in our musical collage. Sergeant Pepper is usually called the first concept album, but you say that it wasn't really a concept album. At least that's not what you started out to create. How so? It was accepted as the first concept album, but it, the only concept was to have an imaginary band who were the Beatles, but they weren't the Beatles. They were Sergeant Pepper. And the Beatles were able to therefore project their thoughts into an imaginary, a virtual band. And uh, that's the only concept about it, which isn't really much of a concept. It just grew there. It grew of its own accord. I bet you a lot of people would be surprised to read that you prefer the Abbey Road album over Sgt. Pepper. Is that still true? I think I prefer the Abbey Road album over Sgt. Pepper. M only marginally, mark you. But I think I prefer it, maybe because I knew, and we all knew, it was going to be the last one. Maybe it's because of that nice, long, um, symphonic idea of mixture of songs on one side with John's contributions, amongst others, single, solo bits on the back. But also the, the songs were so terrific all the way through, and both John and Paul came up with the goods. Um, John contrasted enormously with, when you think of Come Together, which was on the other side, and Because, two different songs, completely different from the same rock and roller that he was talking about. Uh, it's a great album, Abbey Road. I love it. Well, thank you for sending the photos from the nearly finished Cultural Centre in Montserrat. When will it be opened, and what will the uh, centre be used for? Yes, well, the cultural centre in Montserrat is now, the building is now finished, although I think we need to do a little bit of work on it, but that's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting for the equipment to be installed. We've got a tremendous amount of great audio coming in from Yamaha, and they promised to make it the finest uh, cinema sound in the Caribbean. Um, we've got good stage lighting. It's a it's a great place. Um, it holds about between four and 500 people. And already the non-rationers are using it, even though it hasn't been opened properly. The official opening is May the 12th this year, 2007. And my wife and I will be going down there. And uh, we, it's not going to be a big razzmatazz. It'll be a very low-key affair. But we'll probably end up with a, a jump-up with uh, local talents playing... Um, outside the set, outside the centre in the evening. And I, I guess half the island will be there. It should be a good fun. OK. You and I and Lady Judy have had many heartfelt conversations about the environmental predicament that humanity has put this planet into. And it seems that over here in the States anyway, Al Gore's Oscar-winning documentary has finally convinced the majority of people that global warming is a real threat. Is global warming the big buzzword over there in England as well? Global warming? Well, it's on everyone's lips nowadays, isn't it? There's no doubt that it has contributed to a change in our climate. And uh, we, we feel it in England, and I'm sure you feel it in the States. And in the West Indies, too. I think hurricanes are becoming more frequent and more violent. And um, in our country here, 
it's getting this is the, the warmest winter we've had in in living memory and we are growing olive trees in our garden i haven't got any olives yet but, but probably we'll have some in a few years time <laughs> so i can imagine that un, unless we do something about it pretty sharpish then england the great and great britain will become the riviera of the north you know i think that um, it'll be a warm country all round now that isn't so bad but when the sea levels rise we're going to lose an awful lot of the land on our earth that's usable so i believe that al gore's documentary is truthful and i'm very concerned i think everybody is terribly concerned and we've all got to do something about it one of the things you'll definitely learn on 21st Century Radio is what all of us can do about global warming and other aspects of the American lifestyle that threaten our future on this planet. In 1999, we talked with Sir George Martin soon after meeting him and Lady Judy for tea in their hotel room in Washington, D.C. It was at this private meeting where we first relaxed enough to ask them questions that were not related to the Yellow Submarine or the Beatles. We enjoyed a lively discussion about some of the subjects that are most important to us at Hieronymus and Company, namely the environment and consciousness. He agreed to join us on the radio soon after so we could get him on the record. Okay. What is your opinion on genetically modified foods and what might be the potential long-term dangers of tampering with our foods and seeds? Well, this is a hell of a big subject and it's something which is occupying people in our country very much at the moment. There's, it's big news in England because it's been revealed that um, quite a few major um, supermarkets chains like Sainsbury's and others um, are actually selling genetically modified foods already and you don't really know about it unless you read the very, very small print and nobody ever does. Um, we're all worried about it. I think there have been a, a kind of poll of, of opinion in newspapers, and I think everyone is very concerned that when you have this kind of tampering with, with, uh, with the genes of foods, it's like playing God. You're actually modifying things, and you don't know quite what the result's going to be. You, you might be opening a Pandora's box, um, and I'm very much against it. I think that... Um, the idea of making foods, altering foods, so that they last longer or whatever, I think is, is, is crazy. I, I, I think that um, nothing is better to me than natural produce. I'm very lucky in that I live in a village in England where everything is, everything is very natural. Um, we have a, a small holding where people grow vegetables and fruit that is completely organic. They... Um, They've used very little fertilizers, mainly um, animal um, manure that is used in, 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 in the earth. And uh, I'm very happy about what we eat. But, of course, I'm afraid I, other people in cities don't really know what they are eating. I remember reading that before Linda died, Paul and Linda McCartney were one of the largest distributors of organic food in the United Kingdom. Do you think it is important to increase the organic farming movement in the world? Yes, I think that there's a strong movement in England for this. You know, Prince Charles is very, very keen on organic farming, and, and on his estates in Cornwall, he insists that everything is done organically. The big problem with organic farming, I'm afraid, is, is nothing to do with human beings. It's all economy, is that it is more expensive to do than to use um, non-organic pest, you know, uh, chemicals and so on. And um, but the sinister thing about this is that if you use the the um, the uh, chemical way, you get in, entrapped in, in in big business because um, you you have to go down that you have to stay it down that that avenue, and um, we're, we're having a, a big fight about it in England. We, we we think that organic food must be preserved for people. It is. The only way you will be really be healthy and maintain really the healthiness of the human race, because I think if you plow too many chemicals into your food, you are changing what people are. We are what we eat, and um, 
I'm, we're all very concerned about it. Well, that was Sir George Martin talking exclusively to 21st Century Radio about his work with the Beatles and and much more. And we certainly do prize our relationship with Sir George and hope we get a chance to get back to London and see him again in a little while. You know, from a recent news item in Octopus's Garden, that's where we learned that Sir George Martin topped a recent poll as the best producer of all time. Other luminaries on that list included Phil Spector, Brian Wilson, Quincy Jones, and Nigel Goodrich. Sir George Martin, however, was also honored in Ireland with the James Joyce Award from the University College Dublin's Literary and Historical Society for his lifelong contribution to music. See you next week on 21st Century Radio. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And remember, shine your shoes and get a haircut.